Hey everyone, here we are back again for another Bible study at home with First Baptist Roswell. I've really enjoyed getting to do these with you and we do have a little bit more definitive plans uh, for starting next week. So I'll just tell you a little bit about that before we get into our Bible study for today. We've been doing this since March, April, did a Lenten study, did the spiritual disciplines, the Old Testament. Now we're trying to figure out what to do about the fall, if we're going to be able to have some more things in person. It's not looking like that um, too soon anyway. And so uh, starting next week, what we are planning to do is have a little bit more of a prayer meeting kind of Bible study. I know there's a lot of people who love Wednesday night prayer meeting. And so I'm talking to Kevin and Doyle about how we can do that virtually, still have times before this Bible study of praying together. And so uh, we'll have more details on that next week, but we are planning on continuing this virtual Bible study for quite some time until, uh, until everyone feels comfortable coming back, which as we know might be a while. So um, I'm excited to do this with you. We had a one chapter wonder last week. We had Second John. I got to learn a lot as the teacher. I hope you got to learn a lot following along. And we're doing one more One Chapter Wonder this week. This week we are looking at the book of Jude until we start something new next week that'll kind of kick off that new uh, kind of prayer meeting idea that we're talking about for these videos. So let me ask you as we get into our study for today, what do you know about the book of Jude? For me, uh, before I really started looking into it for this, not much. I remember I did a, a, a Bible study on Jude in college, but I didn't remember a lot about it. Um, and so it was really good for me to revisit it. As a kid, Jude was simply the book before Revelation. I was in Bible drill. I memorized the books of the Bible. That was a big deal in our children's ministry. So I did that. could say it really fast. And Jude was that book that you said right before Jude Revelation, and then you were done. But other than that, I didn't know much. So we're going to be looking at the book of Jude today. Really interesting book. It has a lot of language not found in many other places in the Bible. So I'm excited about that. Jude is short for Judas. Uh, and this guy was actually Jesus's half brother. So uh, one of his brothers, we also know James, also his brother, um, and it makes sense. This is not Judas Iscariot. It makes sense then that he would go by Jude, you know, doesn't, doesn't want to go by the name of the guy that everyone's not really happy with the you know, the whole traitor thing. So, um, so he goes by Jude. Um, and interestingly enough, he and James both were not believers in what Jesus was saying during his lifetime. Um, and it makes sense a little bit, you know, it's hard It'd be hard to come to terms knowing that your brother is the Messiah, right? Sibling rivalry, that'd be hard to admit. Uh, but after Jesus' resurrection, both Jude and James uh, became believers and followers and leaders in the church. And so uh, this book is the one that we have written by Jude. And I'm excited to look at it today, so let's get into it for today. Again, we are on one chapter wonders, so there's no chapter to find, just verses. And right now, uh, to start off, we're going to look at Jude 1 through 4. It's kind of a long book, so we've got a lot to cover today. Let's look at it. It says this, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. So a couple things we notice here. Again, we know Jude as the brother of Jesus, and yet he introduces himself as a servant uh, of Jesus. I mean, that has got to show a lot of humility, right? When you come to terms with who your brother is, and you don't even reference yourself as his brother, it's also a sign of respect, uh, but to recognize yourself as a servant of Jesus. 
His audience seems to be Christians in general. Uh, this is kind of an open letter to any people who would claim Jesus as Lord. And so in that sense, it's not audience specific. You know, some letters we have written in the New Testament, they are written to one certain church or to one certain person. Um, and so it's not audience specific. There's still some context around it. Uh, but we're not necessarily reading someone else's mail like we are with some of the other letters that we read. We also see that he gives a quick intro. Um, and then he says he had a purpose in writing this. It was supposed to be uh, about a kind of a nice letter about the salvation that we all share. That could have been a really nice topic for a letter. But recently, it seems like he has changed his mind. And instead, now he wants to write about these folks that he is not too fond of. He is now encouraging people to, quote, contend for the faith because of these other people who have come into the church. He says, quote, their condemnation was written about long ago, and they have secretly slipped in among you. His first big accusation against them is that they are ungodly because they use God's grace as a license to sin. They say, oh, well, God, if God forgives everything, then we can do whatever we want, right? This was a question that also Paul had to deal with. Oh, well, is that what grace means? If we're not on a merit system, if we don't have to earn God's love, can we just do whatever we want? And Paul wrote this, oh, should, should we sin more so that grace is even more? By no means, he said. That's what Paul said. And it seems that Jude is wanting to answer one of these same questions. This was kind of a thought going around. Hey, if it's all love and grace and forgiveness, we can do whatever we want. And Jude and Paul here both say, no, that is not the case. It also says they deny Jesus Christ as Lord. Uh, and this could be one of two things. It could be that they are explicitly saying that Jesus Christ's life doesn't matter, that Jesus Christ was not actually who he said he was. Um, you know, we dealt with that last week in Second John, that he was dealing, John was dealing with a group of Gnostics, those who said it didn't really matter if Jesus was here as an actual person. Um, and so it could be that. They could be actually saying that. He could be writing in reference to these Gnostics. It seems like there's more to it that once we get into the rest of the letter. Uh, or it could just be that he's saying their actions don't demonstrate uh, any sort of profession of faith. Yeah, they might say it, but actually they're denying Jesus Christ as Lord by how they're acting. Uh, so whether it's the exact same situation or not, uh, this is, you got to remember, Christianity at this time is still relatively a new movement. It's still spreading. There is no New Testament that's been compiled yet. The Gospels have been written, many other letters have been written, and those things would get copied and get passed around. That would be a fun thing for a study sometime, the compilation of the New Testament. How did all that actually come together? Great question. Don't have time for it today. Um, and so if there's no actual New Testament saying this is our book, anything like that, well, you have to really watch what you're talking. All these teachings are, many of these teachings are oral teachings not a lot of literacy going around either. Um, and so it's really important that they knock these things out when they come. When heres heresy comes along, when heretics come along, uh, it's really important that they knock these things out. So let's read on and take a look in verses 5 to 7. Um, and I'll just tell you now, Jude spends a lot of time on these people who are in the church who he's not a big fan of. So get ready for that. All right, verses 5 to 7 say this. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. And it's like, whoa, this was starting out as just a nice letter about salvation. Uh, but Jude, maybe we should say, hey, Jude, watch it. I mean, he's really going after him now. He takes it to the next level and he recalls three examples of people in the past 
or those in the past who ignored God or showed contempt for God, did not believe God. Um, and it's the similar to what he believes that these people who are now infiltrating the church are doing. First, he recalls the Israelites who were brought up out of Egypt, um, but also some later rejected God and were given over to judgment. So I have to wonder, anyone out there know anything about that? Follow along in our sprint through the Old Testament. Was there ever a time um, when we saw this happen? People reject God. Oh, wait, it was like every week of our study over and over again. The Egyptians uh, were caught up in the sea as punishment for what God did. The time of the judges, they went back and forth, back and forth. Evil kings would come in and eventually Israel to the north and Judah to the south were both conquered. And we are told it was because of their disobedience. All of that attributed to disobedience. And so that's a good reference that we know. Uh, and then a couple more references. One to fallen angels. Um, there were those who rebelled against God and paid the price for it. And then also a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah who received a punishment, it says, for their sexual immorality and perversion. What does that have to do with these people now? We don't have any reference for that in the church, you know, that that's what they're doing. Um, well, anytime you distort God's purposes and you, you act against him, as Jude explains in this next section, uh, which is still very interesting. Look at verses 8 to 10. It says this, In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. I mean, Jude is pulling no punches here, right? As he said, in the same way the people in the past who were supposed to be God's people, remember that's what all that was about, the people of Israel, they were supposed to be God's people. In the same way that they were rejecting authority, it's happening again now. Uh, that phrase, on the strength of their dreams, again, like I said, a lot of language and imagery in here uh, of that you really don't see many other places in the Bible, uh, but that strength of their dreams is unique, and other translations might just call them dreamers. Uh, we're not exactly sure what that means. These people might have come in and said they had a prophecy from God based on their dreams. It might just mean that, oh, they're dreaming. I don't think so. Um we don't exactly know, but uh, Jude really seems to love obscure references, and we don't know where this one came from, this whole thing about the dispute over Moses' body. That was might have just been kind of this apocryphal, um, traditional story that there was this dispute, this debate, this argument over uh, between Michael and the devil over Moses' body. Uh, but the details of that are not really important here. The point is that even in this weird situation, whatever was going on there, Michael didn't slander like these people are doing now, but instead left it up to God. And yet now these people who come in are slandering others. They're rejecting the authority of the church, saying they know better, and polluting their own bodies. So it's pretty clear that Jude is upset about these people claiming to be followers of Jesus, claiming to want to be part of this Christian fellowship, and then acting in ways that are contrary to God's purposes. All right, so he's just going to keep going off against them. Let's finish this section uh, where he just keeps laying out the charges against these people. All right, verses 11 to 17, I'm sorry, 11 to 16 say this. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. 
They are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Say what you want about Jude, but the guy has a way with words. I mean, he is almost a poet in how he systematically just lays it out against these people. I mean, just destroys them with his words. The way of Cain, he says, they are they care nothing for God's created people. Balaam's error. You remember Balaam and the talking donkey. He loves these references. Uh, Balaam was willing to be compromised for money. Korah's rebellion. This comes from the book of Numbers. Uh, Jude must have been some sort of Old Testament professor or something. Um, he knows all these stories. Korah was a man who resented Moses' leadership and wanted to take over. And let's just say, go back and read the story sometime. It did not go well for him. And again, these people are in the church. They are not outsiders that we're talking about. We're not talking about forces out there. We're talking about forces within the church. He says these people have been at their love feasts. Another interesting way of wording something. He's probably just talking about when the early church had meals together, ate together, might even be referring to communion. Uh, and so I don't want to spend all of our time today on all these charges that is, are laid out against these people. Um, there are plenty, and we need to take note of all these ways that we can go wrong uh, in can go wrong with error in how we act as Christians. Um, but I don't want to run out of time here and miss one of the most important parts where he gets to the ending. The part where he says how we should actually be acting. He lays out all the charges against them, but then says, what are we actually supposed to be doing? So listen up. This is important. What are the early Christians supposed to do about the people? And how about our own lives? It says this, starting in verse 17. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. His tone really changes here. It felt like earlier he was just furiously writing. He just couldn't stand to see what was happening in the church, but now it's a little bit different. He starts out, dear friends, in this, this section he starts out, dear friends, we knew things like this would happen. It's not good what they're doing, but it was foretold long ago that there would be people who we should not listen to. Um, and so what are we supposed to do? We need to keep building up our faith, our own faith, keep growing in Christ. Earlier, we were told that he is wanting believers to contend for the faith and I think this is a big part of what he means by that. I don't think he's necessarily talking about fighting some fight against them, uh, but instead living in such a way that every day you are becoming more and more like Christ, more and more doing what Jesus would do, saying what Jesus would say. Contend for the faith, he's saying, by making it real in your own life so that people can authentically see Jesus when they look at you. He says to keep yourself in God's love. Always remember that it is God's love that binds us together. Jesus told us that it is when we show God's love to other people, that's when other people will know that we are his disciples. It all hinges around that. Keep yourself in God's love. And then in this letter that was filled 
with harshness. We get some more softness from Jude at the end. Be merciful to those who doubt, he says. Jude is not upset with anyone who is doubting, anyone who is struggling in their faith. It's quite the opposite, actually. He's so angry with these people who claim they have all these answers, but their answers are all wrong. And beyond that, work to save others, he says. Work so that others might know the life-changing power of Jesus. And even comes back to it, show mercy to others. That is our call as Christians, to be compassionate to those around us. And finally, he finishes off with kind of a dox doxology here at the end. Starting in verse 24, it says this, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Jude ends here by giving all the glory and the honor and the praise to God. And he shows that his heart is in the right place, that his mindset is Right, that it's not actually about him, but he wants other people to know what the highest priority in life ought to be, and that is placing our faith in God. So it's a lot of material for just, you know, you could probably spend a few weeks on Jude. We're not going to. Uh, but I want to ask you today, as I read through these passages, some very harsh, some much softer and kind and compassionate, uh, where did you hear God? Where did you notice something that you might really need to pay attention to? Jude calls people out on one side, but also offers comfort and gentle instruction on the other. I've heard it said that preachers, and maybe all of us as Christians, I don't know, ought to, uh, we're supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Maybe today you're feeling pretty comfortable and you need to be afflicted. You need those sharp, strong words to rouse you, um, some harshness to maybe uh, wake you up out of your sleep and realize that there are things in your life that are not right and need to be corrected, need to be made right so that you can live as God's called you. Uh, but maybe you're just going through a difficult time and Jude wants you to know that you remain in God's love. Either way, no matter what side you might be on, know that either way, God is for you. God calls you to life in him. He calls you to recognize him and only him as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray together. God, thank you for these opportunities that we have to come together for Bible study, to look into these words of scripture that we might be familiar with and we might not be. Whatever you wanted us to hear today, may we hear it with open ears, with open minds and with open hearts, that you might speak into our life, that we might know of your love for us and that we might live for you as our highest priority, no matter what. It's in your name that we pray, amen.